Enter the Jingpad A1. The Jingpad A1. Jingpad A1. The Jingpad A1 from Jingling. This is a Linux-based tablet. It's an ARM-based tablet. The Jingpad A1 is powered by JingOS. The world's first consumer-ready Linux tablet. Hello, everybody. This is Tech Cut. In this video, what we're going to be doing is talking about Jingling, the company responsible for the Jing pad. But before we get into the weeds, we need to talk about what the company was. Yes, was based on everything I've been seeing, the company is probably no longer. So Jingling was founded in June of 2020 and quickly assembled a team of about 80 people, most of which were primarily focused on JingOS, their flagship operating system. This Linux distribution had the goal of being a consumer friendly mobile operating system with a Linux base and Android application support. The hardware and software teams were separate with the Jing OS team primarily being located in Beijing, while the hardware team was developing in Shenzhen where its actual hardware supply chain was located, and that hardware being this flagship device, the uh, Jingpad A1. Now, funding for this device launched on Indiegogo with a uh, suspiciously low goal of uh, $20,000, which they met rather rapidly. On their Indiegogo here, you could see that it was actually kind of a marketing point funded in 15 minutes. And we could see right here what they actually raised, which was really close to $220,000. But this really was just a drop in the bucket compared to what they're actually able to raise. In some uh, capital funding rounds, they managed to uh, scrape up $10 million for development from uh, Sinovation Ventures, as well as the uh, private equity firm Trust Bridge Partners. And down here, we have a quote from uh, Peter Fang, which is one of the people at this uh, first capital venture firm. And he says, we've seen the best product iteration for work and entertainment through the combination of iPad Pro and the Magic Keyboard, but no tablet maker has delivered a superior user experience for the Android system so far. So we decided to back Jing OS. So essentially these capital investment firms really thought that this device actually had some potential in being a competitor to the iPad. The Jingpad did have this uh, nice little keyboard here that was an optional feature with it, but it also came with a pencil, an attempt to compete long-term with Apple. And honestly, from a hardware perspective, the uh, Jingpad here is awesome. I mean, it's got an AMOLED 2K display, an eight core ARM CPU at just under 2.0 gigahertz, eight gigs of RAM, 256 internal storage, an 8,000 milliamp battery, and a camera that actually can turn out some uh, pretty decent photos. Overall, it's sleek, it's powerful, and the uh, accessories that it can come with are uh, moderately, moderately decent. So what went wrong? First, the software. When I took the initial look at this device, it was missing a lot of the features that you'd need on a daily basis, but overall the software seemed like it was headed in the right direction. With the uh, main problem being that the Jing OS team was not able to deliver on many of the things that they promised, even basic things that probably should have been included in launch. To their credit though, they did improve some things like the virtual keyboard, adding the ability for auto rotation, settings additions such as VPN and better peripheral control. But even with that, there are some issues with this device that I just cannot get around. First, the copy and paste function shows up, but it simply does not work. Something you're probably gonna need on a Linux device like this because you're going to need to be able to copy and paste commands around as their application store is bone dry. And actually, at least as of now, it is more than bone dry. The repositories won't even load properly. The second thing, and probably the most important thing is the price, $699. That was the shipping price for this device. You got discounts if you supported the Indiegogo a little earlier, but that was what the price was going to be, MSRP. And with that, if you wanted this uh, keyboard trackpad combo, this one accessory was $200. And don't get me wrong, this actual device is pretty well built. It's solid. It's I've been using it off and on for quite a bit. And it's pretty strong. I mean, if I actually put the Jing pad in here, it's not going nowhere. But $200 is still a little... uh excessive for this kind of a device here. And the problem was with that in addition is because of the software issues that this thing has, the, the keyboard and trackpad combo is essential to be able to use it unless if you Bluetooth your own devices. But then at that point, it's not as comfortable and ergonomic as it is with their product. To spend about $900 on a device like this alienated a whole group of people in the Linux community that get devices just like this to be able to tinker and play around. 
In my personal opinion, it probably would have been a good move to have a lower spec, lower price device as the introduction device. So that way they could get hardware out and then have community help to actually develop the software properly. Somewhat to what Pine64 is doing ugh, with their uh, Pine phone line here. Now, to be frank, this phone does kind of suck but it's intended to be a tinkering toy for hobbyists and developers. And a device like this with a low cost to entry gives the actual company, Pine64, the perfect amount of time to perfect the devices as well as take the time to go ahead and pick what operating system that they're gonna put on these officially, which they did pick, it's Manjaro. But as you can see, this one is branded with Debian, well, Mobian technically, because this was their attempt or their uh, go with the Mobian system. So they were able to experiment and figure out what worked best on their devices. And with a combination of all that uh, community support and work development, things like that, They've created the PinePhone Pro that we're going to be able to play around with soon. Slightly more expensive, slightly higher spec, but even that is still cheaper than uh, this Jingpad is. Now, Jingling, they, they're a little ambitious, or they were a little ambitious, because they dived in headfirst with their own operating system, their own hardware, and they really did not give themselves that much time to develop everything up to the point where it was actually consumer-friendly, which was the primary goal of the entire project and company. And for my third point here, it's gonna be a mixture of a couple different things, but you can summarize it all with overall communication. Initially, communication wasn't too bad at all. They reached out to a lot of people to get review units out. They were always posting things and updates to Twitter, engaging with the community. And whenever there was any major update, they would have a full dedicated forum post specifically to it with all the various change logs. But when I first noticed that there was going to be a, a problem with how everything is working overall was shortly after I posted my very last video covering the Jing OS, probably about a month or so. I needed to restore it. Something happened, I updated it through the terminal and it didn't like it for some reason, so I needed to factory reset it. I looked through their website, I looked through all the possible documentations, forms, everything like that, and there was not any information. I couldn't get into the device to actually do this through the settings, so there had to be some other way to do it. I messaged my contact on Discord how I actually got the review unit, and I had to be forwarded to a couple different people that didn't know until I finally got put into a group chat with like five different members from the team, all in an attempt to help me format my device. And granted, this was all during the period in which they were already starting to ship out devices to the Indiegogo supporters. The fact that there wasn't some guide somewhere and it took more than one person to help me out with this was incredibly concerning. And another red flag went up when I actually got the information I needed to flash it and the software was... Uh, the software they used required Windows, which is rather odd for a uh, Linux centric company. And as you can see here, the software doesn't really give off the uh, best vibes at all. And going through the process half the time, it just didn't work. And if we, we go to their form here, we can see some of the latest form posts. So if I go to right here under latest June 16th, we can see how to flash the Jing OS ROM and how to flash the Android uh, Jing Pad ROM. They didn't post these until right before they disappeared. And I, you can you can go to this today. I'll post a link in the description, the actual steps to do this. And you can see all the people here having issues and it just not working for a lot of people which really sucks because uh, apparently ubuntu touch is really nice on this device but here you can see the process download this random thing on google drive download the toolkit right here which looks like something i want to be throwing on my computer install the toolkit on your computer let's zoom in here look you get to install some random driver you get to Open a research download exe file. Down here, you actually load in the image. The process is down there and supposedly it should work. I tell you what, if they would have posted that little guide from the beginning, that would have been a huge uh, area of controversy and they probably would have been forced to change that whole process uh, from the start. And now let's say you want to theoretically unlock the bootloader. If we go to this article here on how to install Ubuntu Touch, you can see unlocking the bootloader is one of the requirements. The fact the bootloader is locked alone. How do you unlock the bootloader you might ask? Well, I'll tell you right here, they have a handy guide that they posted. And I think this right here, this update from March 10th is the very last communication or public communication I personally know of, and that's saying you could just flash the Android ROM, which by the way, Android on these devices, I have a second one here to be uh, open here. This probably wasn't a good financial decision on the company's part, but Android is absolutely phenomenal on this device. Like I said earlier, the hardware itself is 
fantastic. If you're interested on seeing more about Android on this device, I recommend you checking out Niccolo's video. He, he has a pretty good one on the, the tablet that could have been. But what I was getting at over here, they have a bunch of warnings. And here, get the device ID, connect to a Linux desktop, at least there's that. Download fast boot, get into bootloader, get the device ID. And now, this is the problem. Submit your device ID via email. Please use bootloader unlock order number plus shopping channel plus device ID as your email title. With that, this is the information you have to submit and you will receive a file from them called unlock.bin. They want a little, uh, <laughs> little waiver. They want you to email them a waiver before you do this, basically. I understand the risks of unlocking the bootloader. Any distros not provided by the Jingoist team have not been certified. Blah, 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 blah. And then with your actual bin, you run a fast boot command to go ahead and unlock that. And of course, no surprise, you see people in here complaining about never actually getting it. It's been more than a week, but luckily we did find this here. Somebody made a handy little tool to not have to rely on the company. Unfortunately, it's not working for me yet. I probably just need to try it again with a different device, but hopefully I could get Ubuntu Touch on one of these so I could make a couple videos on that. But with that, besides the point, the fact that any of this is even something you have to do for a Linux shipped device is mind boggling to me. Part of the joy of using Linux devices is being able to distro hop and switch between various operating systems and software with ease. And that joy is kind of just stripped away with how this software needs to be flashed. It should just be unlocked and we should be able to just boot into an image and immediately install that image onto our internal storage. Easy as that. With the Pine Phone, all you gotta do is throw a SD card in here with the operating system you want and you're good to go. It's one thing to have struggles with like a Samsung or LG phone, something you know is going to be locked down and requires a little bit of workaround, but to have these struggles on a Linux device is just silly. I've tried to reach out to a few different people on the Jingling team, including that initial group chat where I needed help actually flashing the device. Uh, one person replied a few months back confirming initial layoffs and stating that they're not really sure the direction of the company at the moment. And my main contact and one of the head honchos uh, left me on red. And this is right after he told me to hold off on making the uh, video reviewing the uh, second device that they sent me. Following this, there were some major discounts on these uh, Jing pads up, uh, presumably to go ahead and get rid of their inventory. And with all of this, the absolute worst thing that this company did is simply just vanish. There was no announcement, there was no concern for the actual longevity of their devices, and they just didn't say anything to anybody. It had to be a moderator on their Discord server to actually say something in regards to this, and he doesn't even have a connection to the actual staff. Basically, all these Jingpad devices are as is. The source code and drivers have been released, but that alone took way longer than it should have. This moderator is hopeful that they can make a comeback, but I sincerely doubt that, considering that some of the people that I've been messaging have been executive level, and none of them have been active for a pretty long time. So to kind of wrap up, I really do wish this company would have succeeded. Having hardware like this in the Linux space is something we truly need. They, they should have probably just thrown Ubuntu Touch on these things and people would have flocked to purchase them. Their main problem, again, is just diving in headfirst too early and trying to compete at a level they were simply not ready to. Even in Discord from a message uh, a while back from somebody higher up in the company, spoke of incredibly ambitious plans, including a cell phone, ebook, and more. In hindsight, they probably should have put more resources into the hardware, less on software, and kind of use the community as a crutch until they can get themselves up and moving. Because it's companies that take full advantage of community support in this ecosystem that really do wind up succeeding. Overall, this could have been wonderful. I still do hope that there's a small team out there that can turn this around, but more likely I hope that other teams learn from Jingling. Both what they did wrong, and what they did right. So I do hope you enjoyed this video. I, I'm not a fan of making a negative videos, but I covered it enough on this channel that I had almost no choice but to make a follow-up on it. With that, if you enjoy Linux content or just technology content in general, make sure you subscribe and you ring that bell so you do not miss any future uploads. Uh, with all that, I do hope you have an absolutely beautiful day and goodbye.